Good morning. I'm Wendy Goldberg. I'm the executive director of the Tri-Faith Initiative. I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning. Um, what a joy for us to um, come together to be uh, vulnerable. I think that's a bit of what the world is asking of us, um, but also to realize that there is an intersection between um, science, mental health, vulnerability, faith, and that um, we're gonna explore those intersections today. Um, I'll be really honest. I am about uh, three hours in to um, stepping my foot back in from a week's vacation. If you haven't done that recently, I suggest that that be something you consider um, to fill your bucket. Um, I might've overfilled my bucket a little bit um, or at least my belly a little bit during the week. Um, so I'm feeling um, full of gratitude for um, love um, and being able to have spent some time with my family and for um, confidence and trust because this Tri-Faith team, they worked really hard while I was gone to give me um, confidence um, to return and to know that um, we are better together. So um, thank you. Um, for the opportunity for me to share that. Um, one of the things that was shared with me during my time away was by one of my daughter's friends um, when we were talking about how much uncertainty there is in the world. Um, uh, and she said, hope is a discipline. Mm. Um, and I think that um, information is helpful for us as we're trying to build a discipline of hope. And so I'm excited that we have a guest here today who has thought hard about um, living a life to um, advance um, our understanding of how our thoughts impact our physical being. And we're going to learn a little more about him um, today. Um, and I'm terrible at phonics. So um, Roy, tell us how to say your last name and how you would like to be called. Uh Roy or Father Roy is uh, in this group. Roy is very much fine. Uh, and just a minute, I I've changed my room because the Wi-Fi was not sure whether it was from my end. Well, it's so, nice of us to get a tour. <laughs> you had a tour of LMU, yeah. Okay, so uh, take a Roy breath. Pereira. Okay, so for for this for this gathering, Roy is fine. Uh, but even uh, like my students, I tell them, you know, you no need to call me Father Pereira, Father Roy is fine. But uh, truly, among us, uh, Roy is perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you Thanks for Wendy. joining us. Yes. So um, in our conversation as we were planning this, first, first, I would like to say that um, the idea of inviting this conversation came from our chair, um, Dr. Ali Khan. Um, he is a resource in so many ways. Um, and as the numbers of the pandemic have been growing, I reached out to him and said, um, I'm sure the audience would love to hear you again, but who, who, who do you think is doing good work um, that might be a good speaker? And he put me in touch with Father uh, Roy. So thank you um, for that. Um, as I learned in our conversation preparing, um, centering work is very important um, to this uh, ability to bring yourself to this conversation. And so I have asked um, Father Roy to start us out um, with some kind of centering practice. So we'll start there and um, please participate at the level that feels comfortable for you um, and um, know that um, you can turn your screen off or turn your screen on and that I want you to be um, comfortable with this first part. Um, so please. Thank you, Wendy. Yes. I invite you to take a posture which is comfortable to you. Uh, and the best one is that which makes our spine erect. But it has need not be where you're stiff. Okay, as long as you keep your spine erect and then your legs can be in whichever position. I know some people find it very centering to have the legs folded, uh, but that does not matter. As long as our spines are erect, uh, it helps us to focus better. 
and your hands can be either placed in your on your laps as a gesture of openness or you can even join the fingertips whichever works for you so feel comfortable and uh, now very soon I will be inviting you to uh, close your eyes a little later but just to give you a brief background uh, we are people gathered here from different faiths and uh, all of us share the common heritage of the uh, whether we are from Judaism or Christianity or from Islam uh, we have our common roots in the uh, readings of the Old Testament so the word that I'd like to focus on is the word Ruah which is a Hebrew word which means uh, breath and coincidentally, though I prefer to use the word spirit incidentally, the word ruah breath also has the meaning of spirit. So when God breathed life into Adam, our folk father, so it was the breath of life. So you can see this dual meaning of this beautiful Hebrew word ruah which is breath, which is our breathing, but also life and spirit. So it's the same word that the, our Hebrew ancestors used for both. And it makes perfect sense because after all, breath is life, breath is spirit. That's the main difference between a corpse and someone who is alive. And so what we are going to do during the short meditation is to choose the breath as our focus of attention for meditation you could choose a lot of things but for this meditation today i invite you to choose your breath and this ties in also with the great uh, indian buddhist tradition of vipassana where we focus on our breath so we see the coming together of various religions i invite you now to close your eyes and take three or four deep breaths and as you breathe in just breathe out as if you are sighing breathe in and breathe out breathe in and breathe out After you have let go of all your tensions, your worries, your anxieties, I now invite you to return to your normal way of breathing. Whatever it is, don't try to force a long breath or a short breath. Just be in the present moment as your body invites you to breathe. If you are uncomfortable with your eyes closed, then you may choose to keep them half open, focused on something in front, but not focused fully, just sort of like a blurry image. But if you can keep your eyes closed, that also works. And now we are going to focus on our breath. So I invite you to breathe in and breathe out. To breathe in and breathe out gently, calmly, without any tension, allowing the body to relax. Relax at the head level, relax at the shoulder level, just letting go. We return back to focusing on our breathing. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Totally calm, totally relaxed. If it helps you, may, you may choose to focus more intensely on the area around the nostrils where the breath enters the body. Breathing in and breathing out. 
our full attention is on the fact of breathing. I'm going to be silent for a while while you try it on your own, just breathing in, breathing out, and the attention focused on the breathing in a calm, gentle, non-aggressive manner. If you suddenly find that you have a distractive thought, gently bring your awareness back to breathing. Don't scold yourself, don't get irritated. Know that it is the nature of the mind to want to wander. That is us, that is our mind. And so all we need do, as soon as we become aware, just focus back on your breathing. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Gently, calmly, totally relaxed, totally calm our attention fully on our breathing. focus of meditation is to keep coming back to the breathing. It doesn't matter how many times we might get distracted. Keep coming back. We will take one more minute to focus on our breathing before we end this meditation session. So I invite you once again to focus on your breathing, breathing in and breathing out at your own pace in a relaxed manner, totally calm, totally relaxed. Now I invite you to gently come back into our Zoom room. Open your eyes whenever you feel comfortable and let us come back to the space in this room where we reverence one another calmly, gently. And I'm going to put a question to you Feel free to unmute your uh, mics and just answer in a word or two. What is your feeling now? 
How do you feel now? You're allowed to feel shy for 30 seconds. <laughs> you can put your answer in the chat too, if you prefer. Ease, centered, relaxed, more relaxed, less anxious. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You can keep putting your answers in the chat, but yes, uh, even when we have looked at meditation uh, during research time, we get these responses. And obviously that is the benefit of doing a meditation. And as you can see, it's something that you can do anywhere during the day, even when you're sitting at your desk, just take a few minutes for yourself few minutes of self-care to center yourselves, especially during stressful moments. I now hand over to Wendy. Thank you. So first I'd love to learn a little bit more about you or invite the audience to learn a little bit more about you. Um, but let's start with um, a question that I hope we ask each other more often. How are you today? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. And I feel so blessed to be among you. Uh, it's a little ironic that all the time I was Omaha, we didn't get to meet. <laughs> and now that I've come <laughs> way south, but that's life. Okay. And uh, we're always happy whenever to meet again once more, either in Omaha or in some other place. But yes, yeah. I'm good. The, and how the magic of, of Zoom. Thank you. So tell us about your connection to faith. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm going to start by specifically speaking about a little bit of my more consciousness of faith. So I've, I've grown up as a Catholic and, uh, as most of you know, we grew up in a religion, but the specific moment or what we call the Kairos moment when I was more aware of my faith was towards the end of my graduation when I was thinking of, okay, what am I going to do next? You know, get into some business, do an MBA, do this, do that. And suddenly this little voice kept coming up saying, you know, join the Jesuits. And I was like, what? And I just kept pushing it aside because I never considered myself to be you know, a holy guy, a pious guy. I would attend Sunday mass and you know, that was it. We did the normal prayers, but it was, I didn't, I was never an altar server in church. I was never one of the churchly, you know, boys. So I kept pushing this thought away and it kept coming. And I kept telling God, you've got the wrong number. Obviously this dates me to the time when we actually had those phones and no mobile phones. And I'm sure those of you who are my generation will know that wrong numbers were pretty common. So I kept telling God, you've got the wrong number because by then also, I was already involved in theater with music, singing, dancing, and I didn't, that didn't fit the idea of being a priest. So, but you know, the voice doesn't stop. And then finally, to make a long story short, I had to discern. And then I decided to give it a try. I said, if God wants me to be a Jesuit, fine. Uh, you know, I'm going to make the leap of faith. And that's how I entered the Jesuit. And that was 34 years ago. So that's my connection to faith. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what might surprise us about what it was like to be raised as in a Christian family in India? So, uh, uh, in India, the Christians are 2% of the population, so a very small minority. But uh, Christianity has existed in India right from, so we have three movements of Christianity. Uh, so it is believed that St. Thomas the Apostle came across Syria into India, especially the area of Kerala. And that's where we have the first group of Christians, often referred to as Syrian Christians, and they have been around for 2,000 years. 
Uh, the second group of Christians was around the uh, 16th century when uh, uh, Vasco da Gama and all the, uh, the traders started coming in and with the traders also the missionaries came in. And so therefore, as you can see, a lot of us during that time have Portuguese surnames like mine, Pereira or Fernandes or D'Souza or Gonzalez. So especially in the area of uh, Western, Southern India, Goa and a few other places, a lot of conversions took place during that time. And so my ancestry to Christianity goes back around 500 years. And then, of course, the third phase was in the 19th century when Constant Levens, a Belgian Jesuit, came to the central part of India and worked with the indigenous people. And we have a big group of Christians now from there. So this is something that maybe people do not know about the three phases of Christianity and that Christianity has been in India for as long as 2000 years. Thank you. So you have this calling and this faith community. How did you get so engaged in science, neuroscience, physics, chemistry? So when I was in college, that was at St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, uh, I, I took uh, chemistry, physics and maths as my first year. And then after I graduated with chemistry and physics. So that was something that uh, I was always interested on and I did a little bit of these aptitude testing and they said yes you know i think you can go in for science and that's how i became interested in science but i did my msc in chemistry uh, and then i later on uh, when i joined the jesuits i was sent back to the same institute to teach and i taught chemistry for about nine years before i was told by my provincial you better go and get a phd now uh, you seem to be too happy with yourself uh, but during the time of teaching, I think many of you know chemistry classes, whether in India or in, in US, because I know in Harvard also when I, was, uh, when I was at Boston College for my PhD, are huge, 120 to sometimes 150. And the students were coming and they were like very distracted because they've come in from four lectures and tired. And one day I just offered them two minutes of meditation. And after that, the whole class was quiet and they were just listening. So I realized, you know, instead of blaming them for being distracted, uh, this was a way where they could be centered. And after some days, they themselves asked me, you know, Father, can we do some meditation? So they realized the benefit of it. That got me thinking. And so when it came time to do my PhD, I was already interested in the power of the mind and how the mind affects the body. And therefore I opted to do it in the interdisciplinary areas of chemistry, neuroscience and consciousness. And that's where I got my PhD from Boston College. So that's my interest in the mind, but also my dad, he had Parkinson's for many years, but he kept telling his hand, don't shake, don't shake, don't shake. And he lived with that for 30 years, you know, uh, died two years back at the ripe old age of 93. So the power of the mind it has influenced me. And after I did my neuroscience course, I went back, started a neuroscience program, and I've been more in neuroscience ke uh, chemistry since then. So before we dive into your um, more prepared presentation, can you tell us where is the intersection between faith and neuroscience? Wow. Okay, so um, we've often heard the word blind faith, but uh, as you know, uh, in many religions and definitely in Christianity, we, we like to use the word faith seeking understanding. So it's not just blind faith, but a faith where we try to understand. And uh, in a sense, uh, Neuroscience has given me the tools to understand the brain and how our faith works in the brain. Of course, with the advent of neuroscience, sometimes some people stretched it too far to say that, you know, uh, God is all in the head or the whole thing of God spot is in the head. And, you know, we can look at put uh, hook up someone to machines and we will be able to find out where God is and where the, where the meditation lies. Okay, uh, that is a very simplistic understanding and I have a whole session on this separately. But uh, 
neuroscience further confirms my faith and at the same time it helps me to delve into the riches of faith and science together so no longer is uh, religion and science to conflicting opposing bodies as we've come to know them and which is present sometimes today neither is it a compartmental view okay as faraday would say when i close the door of my oratory i open the door of my laboratory no today if you want to progress we need faith we need our religion and we need science to work together hand in hand Beautiful. I'd like to invite you to share your screen and um, I'll uh, give you the floor to, to present um, the information um, that I know that everyone's eager to hear about the intersection of mental health and COVID in particular. And then we'll have a chance to ask some questions and we have a surprise ending. So stick around. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? We can. Okay. So once again thanks to indy and and to dr ali khan for bringing me in i love the title she suggested open hearts open minds open conversations now zooming in most specifically to COVID and mental health i think all of us know how the mind affects the body you tell someone raise your hand okay we think of it and we raise our hands or there's an itch and we scratch it we are aware of the numerous stressors in our lives, you know, even from traveling from our home to work. And uh, uh, the, the whole uh, daily stressors that we are faced to, whether it's work, whether we come home from work, okay, we are aware of that and we are aware how those stressors start playing a role in our lives. And whether it's exam stress, presentation stress, deadline stress, and how does it manifest itself? So for a very long time, it was believed that, oh, stress is just in your head and that someone will tell you, suck it up. Oh, it's just in your head. But more and more we are realizing, yes, it is in our head, but it is not only in the head. Stress manifests itself in the body in so many different ways, okay? And you see on the right side of the screen, of how uh, there is a reduced perception of pain, increased blood pressure, heart attack, uh, increased blood sugar. And over time, it expresses itself in the body as, you know, maybe uh, uh, ulcers in the stomach or constant back pain, lower back pain, shoulder pain, and all these other lifestyle diseases. So the mind affects the body. Okay, it's not just in the mind, it's not just psychological, it's not just a question of sucking it up, but it is actually affecting the body. Okay. Uh, so now with COVID, of course, we have, have a different kind of stress, you know, whether it's working from home, trying to manage the kids, trying to manage the kitchen, you know, uh, we've been the social scene has been practically non-existence we don't have time to de-stress with friends we have been socially excluded okay and of course depending on the socioeconomic status sometimes we've uh, different people uh, are, are affected differently and some have more access to you know uh, there's no question of sharing a laptop sometimes all the kids everyone got their own laptop or their own uh, own ipad whereas in some homes it's like hey my, my my lecture is next i need the laptop so all these play a role um, the quality of our social connections etc and these affect our health and what COVID has done is magnify everything 10 times now this again this slide is too much information but it's something that you are aware of you know uh, and you have maybe seen and heard so the reactions that you may feel include fear and worry, uh, changes in sleep pattern, difficulty concentrating, worsening of chronic health problems, increased use of alcohol, tobacco, drugs. And of course, like in my case, it was increased use of food. So all of us, you know, speak, of course, jokingly about the uh, COVID bulge that we put on, etc. And there are ways we can support ourselves, okay? Uh, avoiding excessive exposure to the media, taking care of our body, okay, deep breaths, meditation, eating healthy, 
Make time to unwind. Remind yourself that strong feelings will fade. Connect with others and share your concerns. Maintain healthy relationships. Now, these things also we may have heard. But sometimes during this time, we reach a time when we say, I don't even have the energy to do this. I know I need to do this. I know I need to do this at the head level. But sometimes I'm so exhausted, so tried, so frustrated that I don't do what I need to do. Okay, so that is where the issue comes in. And this nice cartoon is like, you know, we've gone from SARS to the West Nile virus to the COVID-9. And this poor guy is saying, whatever happened to the common cold? You know, we wish we could go back to the days where, oh, I'm ready to take my flu vaccine and that's it. But this whole, all that is happening to us. And, you know, we earlier believed that maybe in two months, three months, four months, it would get over. We are now already 18 months and it doesn't seem to be getting over. So the sense of lethargy, the sense of giving up tends to come in. Okay, so how do we then bring about the behavior change where we can like, you know, dig into ourselves, find the strength that we need. So many of the other things, you know, are some things you would have already got from other sources you're aware of. Okay, what I've tried to show is that the mind does affect the body and if your immune system is the way it takes the bears the brunt of the burden. So today we know that even in the early stages of COVID, some would get it, some would not get it. And those who got it again, there were, there was, it varied about how it affected you along a spectrum. You could get just sick for a couple of days, or you would go to the other extreme where you had to land up in hospital, land up on a ventilator, and sometimes that was the end of you. So why is it that there is such a great difference and it all depends on the immune system how our immune system is able to cope and for many years uh, medicine thought that the immune system was uh, unaffected by environmental factors and now we know that that is not true the immune system is affected and therefore we have compromised immune systems. So even now in this couple of months that we are going through, many of us are vaccinated, many of us are taking our precautions, but the new variant is coming in. So what can we do to really build up the immune system? Okay. And there are many things that uh, in terms of your exercise, diet, health, etc., that we mentioned, but sometimes it's important to know that we still need to be able to get that impetus to do that. And for that, the first thing I would like to say is willpower. We all know about willpower. It can be exercised like a muscle, and but you can wear it out. So sometimes when COVID carries on over so many months, your willpower can slag, okay? And therefore, it is important to know that willpower has a role, but willpower tends to plateau after a certain while. This is what neuroscience tells us. And therefore, we need sometimes to dig into ourselves and find that extra strength that helps us to carry on. Okay, second, exercise. Now, again, exercise for many years we said okay you do physical exercise it's good for the body of course it's good for the body it, it, it does so many things and benefits us but what we learn from neuroscience is while exercise physical exercise is good for the body brain exercises is good for the brain like your pseudo puzzles your crosswords uh, you know uh, learning a new language all that is good for the brain but what is specially new is yes Physical exercise, good for the body. Mental exercise, good for the brain. What is new especially is that physical exercise is also good for the brain. So uh, in a way, just the fact of running your cardio, you know, uh, the blood, the blood uh, keeps increasing. It, the more blood to the brain allows for all the, uh, what we say, the synaptic pruning and allows for cleansing and allows us. So a lot of the, there's a whole exercise that we do, our physical exercise is good for the brain, improves memory, 
LinkedIn's intention span, boost decision making, prompts growth of nerve cells, etc. So there's so much that benefits. So um, we should not just poo poo exercise. Oh, it's only for bodybuilders. Of it's only I want to get a good body. No, 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 no. It's also for your brain and also for your emotional resistance, your emotional uh, resilience that is to be built up. Okay. So can I ask a question there? Is sure. there is there a is there a boundary for that? Is that like all any exercise, little bits of exercise? Is there like a a, a point where it's like, well, that, well, that was that was nice, but it wasn't quite enough to get you to that place? Or, a, um, I'm just you know, me, I'm 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 somewhere looking between the like permission for a, a little bit to be enough and inspiration for you to tell me to do more. Okay, okay, okay. That, that's a very good question, you know, and I think all of us with our busy schedules want to know. Now, the, 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 the uh, received wisdom is that at least uh, thrice a week, you know, uh, in whatever form that you want to do it, you know, just even cardio. Uh, but what is important is choose something that you enjoy doing, okay? So uh, just because everyone's going for a walk, no, I love swimming, so maybe I, I'll go to the pool as long as the pools are open, okay? So choose something that you love doing. Okay, I hate going for a walk, I hate swimming, but I love dancing, okay? Just put some music in your room, okay? For half an hour, just dance, you know? No one's looking, you have the world to yourself. So choose something that is going to be sustainable. Otherwise, you're going to be adding one more burden in this COVID time to yourself, oh, I have to do an exercise, no. And if you like weights, fine. If you like yoga, so choose something that will help you. Basically, what they say is try to ramp up your heart rate so that the blood circulation reaches the brain and you're, you are able to get the benefits of the emotional. So uh, I'm sorry, Wendy, I'm not sure whether uh, <laughs> I made you do more than, but yeah, let's say thrice a week. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, and then, Maybe I'll just go quickly through this. So step one, what is the change that I want to bring? So at this point in my life, okay? So place that thought in your mind, okay? Uh, in religious terms, what is the grace that I seek from God, from my higher power, from whoever I believe in? So uh, we have to keep repeatedly placing that change that we want to be. So if, if I'm the person who I need to get more exercise, I need to place that in my mind, okay? And before going to bed, okay, look at uh, how it is going to help me and this is what I need to do, okay? And then again, for, to bring about change in our lives, we have to be clear about what it is. So it cannot be fuzzy because then the brain gets confused, okay? But if the brain has a clear focus, you know, like the magnifying glass, then it is able to, it's as if the universe, the world, God, puts everything at your disposal and you're able to bring about the change. Frame it in the positive. Now, if I'm going to talk about, you know, I want to give up smoking because cigarette smoking is bad for health, that's not going to motivate you. And we know so many cigarette smokers who know that cigarette smoking. But okay, I want to frame it. I want to get a, I want to be active. I want my lungs to be pure. I want to fill myself with pure. So whatever you want to change, frame it in the positive. And of course, we know, stay positive even during this time. Okay, we are passing through a cloud. Maybe the, the black clouds are longer than I want, but stay positive. Write it down on paper, on post-it, on your cell phone, on a free flashcards, on bath. This is the change that I want to bring in my life during this time. Talk about it, okay? Spiritual conversations, not like spiritual, spiritual, but this is something at the deep level where you can talk to a friend. You know, hey, this is what I'm going through. This is my difficulty, and this is what I'm trying to do. So conversations, very important. Believe you have already received the gift that you are asking for, or believe you have already made the behavior change. And a nice soundbite is, fake it till you make it. So, you know, just, uh, okay, I already see myself having this nice six pack and I see myself reduced, you know, and I'm believing that. And believe me, it helps. So the belief that I'm already there is, is much more positive than, you know, thinking about the negative. 
And finally, of course, we all come from a religious tradition, even if you, are, uh, you don't, don't believe in some concrete organized religion, appeal to a higher power, because that is also which helps the process. Okay, so now uh, we'll go the questions and then we'll come up to this song later on. Uh, or, or do you want me to just finish with the song because I'm afraid I might lose the, yeah? Okay, so the song is Side by Side. It's a very old song, but I adapted it for COVID. Side by side, yes, but six feet apart, okay? But the, the beauty of the original song is speaks about our social relationships. And why I liked it for COVID was, you know, we are going to get through this side by side, you know, holding each other's hands, wearing masks, getting vaccinated, helping one another in the process. We can do it. We can overcome COVID. We can fight COVID as long as we do it side by side. And it is with friends, family, with the whole country, with whole nations. Okay, enjoy. This classic by Patty Klein, Side by Side, is still relevant for us in today's times of COVID-19. As long as we stick together, help each other out, and stay side by side, we are going, gonna see this through. Enjoy. coming tomorrow maybe trouble and sorrow but we're traveling along singing our song side by side through all kinds of weather what if the sky should fall as long as we're together it doesn't matter at all the quarrels and parted we'll be the same as we started just traveling along singing our song side by side just traveling along singing our song side by side side by side Side by side Do -do 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 -do. We have our troubles and parted We'll be the same as we started Just traveling along Singing our song Side Okay. Thank you. Wow. I don't know. You've added a smile to my face. Thank you. Oh, so um, we have a few minutes left to visit. I'd, I'd like to invite you to um, reflect on what we learned or maybe already knew but needed to rehear today. Um, but how, how are you holding this? I'm still singing over here, you know, like side by side. That was nice. awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. I needed that today. I really <laughs> did. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how just a few minutes of breath and a few minutes of joy really can change your energy? And yeah, thank I really you. Did it. <laughs> I do. Connie. Thinking in terms of side by side too is just so important and it, it can be six feet or through Zoom or whatever, but we've got each other and how grateful that makes me. Look at you and Mark side by side there. It doesn't look like they're six <laughs> feet there. 
<laughs> and we hold hands and I mean, it just means the world. And, you know, we are very fortunate because a lot of people are single people and they don't have that side by side. And I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Any questions for Father Roy? I, I was just, I, I don't know if I have a question, but I, I just have a, I guess, a comment. Um, so I, I've done a lot over the years with centering prayer and the importance of centering prayer. Um, I'm Christian. I'm one of the pastors at Countryside. And um, so, hello, nice to meet you. Um, but certainly the practice of centering prayer has um, been pivotal in my understanding of how important it is to listen to listen to God, to listen to self, and then to listen to others, because listening is loving, right? And that's what I did my dissertation work on was that kind of that kind of model. So I really appreciated that. And um, mindfulness in general really helps us because there is there's a lot of chaos <laughs> going on right now um, in so many different places. Um, but certainly. Um, one of the things I recently went home um, to Alabama, uh, my father is unwell, my grandmother is even more unwell. Um, but one of the things that um, I did as a child, and I did it again, when I was there in Alabama, was, um, and this is before I knew about centering prayer and those kinds of meditative practices, is there was a practice um, of rocking on the porch just rocking and thinking and just being. And sometimes I had conversation and sometimes it didn't. Um, but I found myself rocking for hours and <laughs> hours on the porch, just recentering. And I was really thinking about, you know, when I came to Tri Faith, one of the things that I thought of um, in relationship to Tri Faith was that I was like, oh, look at this. We can birth heaven on earth through this thing with the intercultural and interspiritual work that we do here. Da, 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 da. What I was reminded of um, in that time, rocking on the porch in Alabama, um, was that it is so much more present than that. It's not based, the birthing of heaven in our midst is not based on location or organizations. It is based on an intentionality and a mindfulness and an acceptance of the something that is greater than everything and is present in rocking on the porch or you know, visiting with a friend or giving your brother a hug. Uh, all of these things are centering practices um, that are things that give us these, this, that mysterious something that most of us call love or purpose yeah. or joy um, that help us to have a reason to get up in the morning and a purposefulness that is uh, manifested in the way that we live our lives and then doing the next right thing and those kinds of things. And so I think that recentering practices such as that um, are very important, not just for our neurological health, our spiritual health, but also in terms of creating oneness, because um, everybody gets that if they sit back and think about that, regardless of religious practices, um, that there's something more um, that is manifested through our common humanity um, and the human experience as part of a greater creation. So those are just my thoughts in terms of what you're saying. I, I agree with you. you. The rocking idea reminds me also of tapping. Um, I, I have really found that there are times that um, when I can't quite feel the fake it till you make it stage, um, that even just doing um, some gentle tapping at any place in my body it really is whether it's just the consistency of it or the feeling of you know touching self um it's calming for me what about for others karen i see you've been crochet you know, the fiber arts whether you can you know is another thing they i've seen studies where they show that yarn itself and it moving through your hands does a lot with the centering that you talk about and it helped keep me focused on you know a presentation to have this yarn in my hand with the you know a stitch i know by rote i don't have to think about it i can just sit here hmm. pay attention otherwise my mind's wandering all over the internet 
not hearing. Thank you. So Karen, uh, just uh, neuroscience has this thing of uh, the mind uh, abhors a vacuum, the brain abhors a vacuum. It will always choose something to latch on. And uh, even when I'm doing the meditation, I always say our mind is like a thousand elephants gone wild in the jungle. And we know that, you know, we love to jump on one thought to the other. But uh, as you rightly said, crochet or, you know, rocking, or uh, therefore, when we are doing meditation earlier, uh, me uh, gurus, you said, uh, the purpose of meditation is to keep your mind blank. No, 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 that's not going to happen. So because we know our mind cannot do that, we intentionally choose either breath or a painting or a sunset, you know, to, we have to choose something and then the mind sort of anchors there and then you're able to focus on the talk or your studies or whatever this thing. So I think uh, I think all of you all have shared, you know, Anna, thanks for your sharing also, Wendy, uh, a very important aspect. Now, before I, I just want to mention one more thing since you all did enjoy the, uh, the, the, the music. So I invite you to, there's a much longer talk on COVID and immune system, you know, uh, which, I, as I said, I loved Wendy's, uh, uh, the way she put today, I said that's more like, it because I've given a lot of, so they're all on YouTube. And I would, uh, if you have the time, please go and visit my channel, Roy Pereira SJ. But there's talks on immune system COVID, but also there's also fun pieces like piano and I do fun things at times. So uh, you're most welcome. Uh, please subscribe because you know that helps you to reach a certain number of subscribers and then I can broadcast live till now I cannot broadcast live because they want you to do a certain number of subscribers but just putting it out there you know there's no monetary gain then you don't have to pay anything to subscribe in YouTube you just subscribe and you get that but there's a lot available from my side and I'm happy to share it with you beautiful thank you anyone else Jonathan, I see your note in the um, in the chat. Thank you, um, Ali, our program associate, did a really beautiful session in um, our staff meeting about uh, the impact of the of the rosary beads and and so much to learn there. Maybe we need to add Ali to our cycle here to teach about that to a larger audience. Um, nice. I'll just leave it as a teaser because I think it's a really good idea. Um, Ali, do you? you do you may, maybe want to speak to if that is how you agree with Jonathan? Um, yeah, I think the the beads of the rosary can definitely help be like a centering thing and something to focus on, something to have in your hands while uh, you pray. Although personally, I think half the time if I'm praying the rosary, I'm just using my fingers, <laughs> counting on those, because um, sometimes I don't have one with me. But uh, yeah, it's definitely helpful to have something physical and tactile uh, while doing a prayer that's as meditative and uh, that goes as deep for um, like 15 to 20 minutes like the rosary. Right. Well, um, I think we have a lot to um, carry forward from today. So uh, Father Roy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will add a survey um, in the link here. Um, we, as always, would love your feedback um, about today's session. And um, uh, I want to make sure that you know um, on September 11th um, is the 20th anniversary of um, the attacks um, and um, all of the uh, implications of that uh, historic day. Um, we, have, we are uh, doing quite a bit of programming before um, September 11th, um, on the day of September 11th and following um, to help us to process um, the pain of that day and to come into more understanding of uh, the backlash in terms of religious freedom and, um, and such. Uh, so um, please watch all of our, our channels, um, but, but we hope you will join us on the evening of September 11th here as we come together um, in community um, outside. Um, and details will be unfolding um, about that in, in all the channels you get your information. Um, and um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please um, hold all of this real close and take good care. I, I suggest um, perhaps think about a couple of people who might need you to reach out to them today and to just call and share something um, 
that feels like you have some, if you feel like you have some extra strength from this to send, send that to someone else who might be needing it today. Cause, cause we all need those calls. Yes, father. Uh, just an appeal. So, you know, about 10 to 15 years back, the Jesuits of India uh, and South Asia volunteered to be in Afghanistan. So for the last 10, 15 years, we've been uh, having small schools and teaching them. And where I was at St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, we used to get teachers from there, train them, send them back. And now two Jesuits are still stuck there. So I'd like your prayers that they may uh, be able to come across and that, you know, uh, and pray for the Afghan people. It, it's so, 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 so painful to just see what's going on. But uh, I, so and I would like to end with a word of thanks to Dr. Wendy and to Dr. Ali and to all of you for joining me. Thank you. I feel so blessed. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you for that reminder. Tonight on the uh, Bob Carey Bridge, um, there is a gathering of the Afghan community. Um, the city has agreed to uh, turn the lights of the bridge to the colors of the Afghan flag. Um, we'll be gathering there starting at 730. It's not a tri-faith event, but we are um, supporting the Afghan community by gathering with them um, and their families to show solidarity. Um, so if that works into your schedule um, to physically or mentally be present for that in any way, please keep um, all of it in your heart. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone.